Doll's House. Holly Mazza in conversation with designer Lily Arnold. Holly is sat on a chair to the right, facing Lily on the left. They are both sat on a stage with the auditorium behind them with three tiers of seating. Holly is a 30-year-old white woman with median length dark brown hair. She is wearing round glasses, a black jumpsuit, bright blue socks with bees on them and black ankle boots. Lily is a white woman in her mid-30s with short blonde hair. She is wearing a black crop jacket, black t-shirt, blue ankle length trousers and trainers. Hi, I'm Holly Mazza, the Head of Drama at Fulham Boys School, and I'm joined by Lily Arnold, the set and costume designer for A Doll's House, which was first performed here at the Lyric Hammersmith in 2019. Hi Lily. Hello. So today we're going to talk about how you came up with the set and costume design for A Doll's House. I'm really interested in how you started this process. What parameters were you given? Uh, which spurred on your first design? As with uh, pretty much all productions um, that I take on as designer, uh, the theatre company um, or the venue slash theatre company where the production is being produced um, will usually give you a, a, a sort of parameters or guideline, um, often as a document to begin with, and then we'll have a meeting about it. Um, also what the space, the venue that you're going to be designing the show in, um, and the production manager who is who sort of oversees the the, the construction and build um, part of the design um, they will provide you with technical drawings of the venue so you can know exactly kind of where the edges are and how deep the stage is and how tall the space is um, whether you need to have access all around the stage in the wings for um, to allow for a crossover, which is where the actors can kind of pass behind the set. Any other sort of technical things about the space that are gonna inform how you design the play. You do what's called a white card model presentation, which is the first time that anyone apart from the director will have seen your design. Uh, and at, it's at that point that the, the, the uh, the design that you've suggested will be costed by the production manager. So they'll take your white card model, which as the name suggests, is usually uh, a white card version of it. So you might not have got around to painting it at all or adding te textures. It's very much a kind of bare bones um, of the structure of it. Um, and the production manager will take that and they'll start to f figure out how much it's all gonna cost. For a doll's house, uh, the white card was actually which doesn't always happen, but it was actually quite similar to what the final design was. Um, because in some ways, the design for the show was quite simple because it was one static set. So it didn't have a revolve. It didn't have big bits of moving scenery. Um, so, so there was kind of not very many um, denominators. There wasn't that much that you could strip away uh, other than changing the entire design. Um, the, the, the expense with this show was that it was of such a big scale. So it filled almost the entire stage. Um, I think we had about a metre and a half upstage of the back wall of the set, um, which did allow for actors to pass behind the set unseen by the audience. Um, but other than that, it literally took up the entire kind of stage space um, and was made from lots of steel and lots of wood. Um, I think those were the two main sort of material ingredients. Um, so it was quite difficult to sort of take any of the bits of it away without yeah, really having to change the whole thing. Great. And you mentioned that it was quite a pared back mm. naturalistic set. What was the reason behind going for that? Um, well, I think Rachel and I felt like we needed, we wanted to um, give these characters sort of space to breathe. I think also it came from um, the character Tom refers to Nehru um, a few times during the play as a as a kind of caged bird, um, his skylark I think he calls her, um, and this idea that she was this you know this uh, again as he says this exotic kind of pr precious object that was that was kind of flitting about in this quite um, concrete feeling almost prison-like space um, that didn't have lots of detail and decoration that felt kind of over-embellished. 
um, because actually it didn't feel to us like it was about the those kind of details and embellishments of their of their life it was about their relationships the relationships of the characters and how they kind of collide and how they navigate around each other in the space rather than how the spaces control them and actually Niru's the kind of she's the nucleus she's the the kind of the center point around which everything spins um, and so kind of seeing her in this massive space felt like the right the right kind of way forward I guess. We talk sometimes in drama in terms of set design of time atmosphere and location mm -hmm. obviously this was set in Victorian Calcutta how much did that influence your set design? Yeah I mean a lot really although you wouldn't necessarily immediately be able to see that influence I guess in a way that you would if we'd done a much more naturalistic version of the play um, but I think for me it's always vital that no matter whether your final design outcome is a kind of Peter Brook white box, um, that you, your starting point is what was real at that time and what was really, you know, what did things look like then and what were the people like of that time and how did they, what was their sort of social system and what were the politics of the time and, you know, you kind of, you assemble yourself the sort of known facts of that era. Um, I went to Kew Gardens um, because I'd come across um, a, a thing called a Wardian case, which is basically a kind of mini, uh, kind of a mini sort of greenhouse, uh, which I think these days is called a terrarium. Um, but it was basically uh, a thing in Victorian times that, that people would give to each other with exotic plants in. So if you lived in this country, um, someone might send you from another country um, a tropical plant that obviously can't exist in the British climate. Um, so you'd keep it in this little um, sort of micro ecosystem of its own, um, like a kind of precious little object. And then I quickly realised that actually there's a lot of um, symbolic um, mirror mirroring of how Nehru is in the space uh, that she lives in and how Tom has kind of constructed this kind of glass house around her and that she's this exotic um, creature that's existing in a space that she can kind of see out of. She has an understanding of what the world is outside of that space, but she somehow can't access it in the way that she wants to, which is what she realises at the end that actually she, as much as she on paper has her freedom because Tom allows her to move freely and doesn't make her wear you know, Western clothes, those things, she actually isn't free. And that's, yeah, her realization at the end, which is why she leaves. When she leaves, she obviously leaves through the back door, yeah. um, which in Ibsen's original is sort of quite a big moment. Mm -hmm. What, what did you, how did you go about deciding what that door was going to look like? Yeah, I mean, that was, it was quite tricky actually, because I can't pinpoint exactly why this is, but I'd felt like um, that the door that she leaves at the end has to have been unbreached um, throughout the rest of the story. And also it felt like it needed to be visible and quite central. Um, that's probably also my leaning always towards sy symmetry and there's something in that and the power of this kind of portal to the, the, the kind of world beyond. Um, it became a little bit tricky because obviously there are comings and goings in the story of the play. So, you know, Dr. Rank enters and Mrs. Lahiri come, enters sort of at a similar time. And, you know, Rachel and I were kind of like, okay, well, how can we make it make sense that this door isn't breached? Um, and then actually, uh, brilliantly, which happened a few times with this um, production, we found out that there could have been a version with the kind of courtyard house that we'd set the play in, where they had a side entrance um, to the property that would have been used by the kind of daily comings and goings of friends and family. And, you know, unless you were a kind of dignitary or someone very senior, you wouldn't have come through that main door anyway. And that door would have just been 
a kind of presentational um, front door out onto the street, um, but not really used, yeah, kind of day to day. So suddenly that was like, okay, brilliant. That makes, that really helps because it fits in with the rest of the jigsaw that we're trying to put together. And it means that when Neri leaves at the end, she's not only kind of breaching that um, closed door, kind of moving through that, um, that sort of portal, but she's also presenting herself to the world. Um, if we imagine that that door literally opens directly onto a street outside, but there's this really kind of uh, both ornate but also heavy obstacle of the door that's preventing her from that kind of free passage. Um, it's kind of like Tom, I guess, a bit the door. So if the tree in this design is is sort of Nero and their marriage, then the door is is kind of symbolic of of Tom sort of standing in front of her, not permitting her to pass. And I guess if the door in some ways symbolises Tom and the tree symbolises <clears throat> their relationship, something that struck me as being quite symbolic as well in this play was the different uses of levels mm. throughout. Um, I wonder how much that was uh, informed by the culture, um, the sort of caste system yeah. and that kind of thing, or if it was purely status driven. I remember coming into the theatre on the first day of the fit up before the set had really been painted and looking at the level of that Varan sort of balcony and thinking, blimey, that's really high. <laughs> uh, and thinking, you know, these actors are going to really have to kind of crane their necks to look up to it. And, um, you know, but we, we made the decision to have it that height because we wanted it to have an echo of the auditorium. Um, so that it felt sort of like a fluid extension of the balcony levels in the auditorium. And also that it was high enough that it did feel like when a character was up on that level, they were dominant, they were, yeah, they had a very strong position in relation to whoever was, um, you know, down on the, on the sort of seemingly kind of sunken central section of the, um, of the veranda. And also to give us a kind of voyeuristic, um, option as well for people to be uh, kind of lingering on the on the sort of perimeter of a scene um, so that our transitions weren't sort of you know jump cut or st static but people could appear before they then entered into the scene in a more kind of fluid fashion um, which is also why having these we had two doorways we had actually three doorways on the lower level and then we had two on the upper level um, which didn't have doors, they were just openings. Um, and that allowed again for the characters to kind of, they could sort of linger in the doorway without stepping into the space. Um, so you couldn't see them coming, which gave us the option then for people to just, to kind of ambush scenes. And, and that all kind of tied into this feeling of, of tension and, um, you know, at any moment, any conversation could be in interrupted and people could be overheard and, you know, someone could have overheard Nehru telling Mrs Lahiri that she'd forged the papers um, for, you know, or that she'd, you know, procured, pro procured this money. Uh, and you just wouldn't know because they could have just been just out of eye, eye line, just through the door. So that all kind of helped to charge the space, I suppose, with this um, potential for exposure. And I think that was enhanced by the fact that there weren't any set changes yeah. you had lighting used really effectively mm. to take us from one room to another as it were yeah. how did you work with the lighting designer to decide that so kevin the lighting designer came to the final model showing um and saw the 1 to 25 scale version of the of the um the design but he had this idea to um rig the lamps, the lights to the lighting bar, as we normally would do, um, but actually to fly the whole bar with, you know, 10 lamps on, um, out, up, during the show, so that you got this sense of the light moving um, around, sort of across the space, um, and there, thereby the sense of time passing, and the sun moving over this, um, over this house. Um, and also through the tree, he did a similar thing, so that he could, move the shadow around the kind of internal courtyard of the space 
um, which was amazingly effective, actually. Um, so yeah, it kind of his lighting design was in some ways very naturalistic, but then he was he also chose some lighting states that were slightly more abstract. Um, so I think for one of the moments between Nehru and Mrs. Lahiri, um, which was blocked as being downstage left, um, he created a state that was actually quite kind of um, uh, defined and focused, um, which you know felt in some ways. Um, at odds slightly with the naturalistic space around them, but also made sense in relation to where the balconies were. And we did, we did sort of use artistic license in places to um, to suggest that we were in a different space, even though we were physically still in in the one space. Um, but, but I mean, props were actually props became very handy for that because because we didn't have lots of um, you know, set decoration, and we didn't have a, a scene change to go into a physical, a physically different um, environment. We used, uh, you know, props like two glasses of two whiskey glasses and a bottle of whiskey to suggest that we were in Tom's study, um, or a shrine to suggest that we were in the servants' quarters. Or you know, we kind of we we very caref carefully picked those props out that said time and place. Um, so that we could then not have to kind of overpopulate the space around that. Um, so I think as always, you know, the aim really is to distill as much as you can into, um, few, for me anyway, few, kind of fewer objects rather than having lots of stuff. To what extent would you say that the set is a representation of Neri's psychological state throughout the play? Yeah, I mean, I think, as I said before, with this play specifically, it's all about that. I mean, that is what the story is about, is her um, her transgression. Um, so my challenge was how to have the environment around her reflect that, um, which we didn't do in a way that was kind of overtly um, obvious or kind of on the nose. It was quite subtle. Um, and I guess the tree that grew up through from from the sort of ground level um, from the red tiles that were sort of the centre of the courtyard all the way up through the space um, through the courtyard and then up out through the roof of the set um, was the kind of most obvious direct link to um, Nehru and her state of mind um, being that she was has has sort of spent her time with Tom kind of searching for the light and trying to grow up and out of um, the life that she lives. Um, and then there were sort of elements like um, the letterbox, which um, the letter from Das is um, posted into, which obviously holds the, the truth about her having um, forged these papers and borrowed money. Um, there was a light we decided, I think Kevin, yeah, Kevin and Rachel decided that it would help with the tension towards the end of the play to illuminate that letter as it dropped into the box. Um, we spent a long time trying to find the right letter box. Um, and so I think in the end, we ended up finding something that was almost there, but we had to kind of um, adapt it because it, we needed it to have a glass front so that when the letter was posted through the letter box in the door, we could see it then on the inside of the house appear in, in the letterbox. Um, and it also needed to be lockable so that Tom could be the only person um, with the key, um, which you know relates to his control and the kind of patriarchal um, society of the time that you know the man of the house would be the only person with access to that um, sort of communication stream. Um, so yeah, but that light became also part of I guess a reflection of her state of mind that she, as soon as that letter lands, that light goes on and she turns into this very different, very kind of charged being um, until it's taken out of that box and, and the sort of going out of the light is Tom reading it. And then we move into a different kind of, a different uh, chapter of the story. Could you tell us a bit about the way that you designed the costumes for this play? Tanika, very early on in the process, I think maybe the first meeting that Rachel and I had with her to talk about design, 
um, she mentioned to us a film called Charulata, which is a, um, a film made in India in the 60s, I think, um, but set in at the turn of the century. So late Victorian, but I think, yeah, probably about 10, 11 years after uh, A Doll's House is set. It was interesting in this film that the, the sort of female protagonist um, was wearing s s traditional sari, but the blouse that she was wearing underneath her sari had really, um, was very uh, similar to a, a British Western Victorian blouse shape. The shape of it was very much, um, you know, a sort of tighter sleeve with lots of um, kind of frill detail and lace. Um, some of them were quite high necked, um, again, with lots of detail, lots of lacing detail um, on them. And I was really surprised by that because I had seen from other photos of women of the time something quite different and to find out that actually there was a lot of merging um, of styles was was great because it also tied into this idea that as much as Tom uh, allows Neeru to wear sari and to you know wear traditional Indian dress and not make her you know wear kind of Christian British um, clothing there's been a bit of seeping in of that style um, and that was kind of helpful to be able to to clothe her in that in 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 something that felt kind of in both worlds in in a way. Were there different ways of tying the saris? Yeah, lots, many, um, and again, dependent on exactly what region you you were from, and then also dependent on what social status you were. So a, the lady of the house would tie her sari differently to. Um, a servant. We used a technique that sort of went around the waist and then over the shoulder, so it left a kind of um, a quite a long strip of fabric that was kind of loose. And I think Angela really liked that because it gave her something to hold and to kind of fiddle with. Um, so it wasn't all really neatly tucked in everywhere. Um, there was a section of it that she could kind of have available to her to kind of screw up and I mean Anjana is the most incredible physical actor like she's always moving her toes are always tapping and her eyes are always moving and and the same with her hands like she's always acting with everything and so her, for her having that bit of fabric that she could manipulate in response to how she was feeling to communicate the feelings of, of Nero I think was quite useful. Um, and then we looked. A, I looked a lot at colour and and how she lived in in her setting. The first one was a kind of dusty pink colour, um, which really kind of sat her nicely in the colours of the set. So so she kind of was at one with it. Um, and then the second sari she had was a deeper, more sort of richer red, um, with the idea being that her, as her kind of her will and her resolve to to kind of escape her life um, increased the kind of the vivid saturated color increased um, and then her final costume was completely had a completely different feel to it because it was a very pale blue um, and a color that we hadn't really seen before and a very cold color and it sat at odds with the 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 kind of internal environment of the courtyard of her house um, which was intentional because she's about to leave. So she's kind of put that on as a first marker of her ambition to escape her life, basically. Um, so that, yeah, that was the sort of kind of progression. Um, whereas with the male characters, um, they, Dr. Rank and Tom, both uh, very much conform to the dress of the time of a British colonial, um, you know, male of their kind of standing. Um, so they were in off-whites because um, I did want to create a bit of a feel like, you know, they're obviously living in this hot country. Um, they're not so wealthy that they can have their clothes laundered all the time. Um, you know, a bit of a feeling that, yeah, that it's hot and it's uncomfortable and they're kind of trussed up and that's not how they really want to be. But they're also unable to kind of break away from how they should be. Um, they don't have that kind of sense of freedom. Accessories and hair and makeup, how much did that tie in with the costume design? For Anjana playing Neeru, she had, I think she had four or five different um, looks with her hair. So we started with it being um, up, um, neater, and by the end it was a much more relaxed um, kind of down look. Um, and then we also fed in, you know, um, 
some research that I'd done of ways in which women of her kind of status and um, place in society would have worn their hair in relation to the ser you know to the servants or in relation to Mrs Lahiri who's a widow so she wouldn't have necessarily had loads of embellishments and then the same with the men that came slightly more from research and you know looking up all the different varieties of Victorian beard styles um, but then also feeding in what the climate was like and you know it's likely that they wouldn't have had massive heavy beards because it was just too hot um, and then so you're kind of feeding in historical context and then you're also feeding in character context so as much as Tom might have had a big beard and very well kept, kept hair his character doesn't necessarily befit that so we went for a kind of slightly longer hair for him um, that suggests that he you know does look after himself like he's not completely wild um, but also uh, he doesn't come across as a very kind of slick back buttoned up person he's kind of somewhere in between mm -hmm.